morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, I just remind everyone to turn off electrical devices or turn to silent, please. We've received apologies from committee members Gordon MacDonald and Angela Constance and Tom Mason will be standing in for Dean Lockhart who has also sent his apologies. Um, item one is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Um, we turn now to our inquiry into construction in Scotland's economy, and today we have uh, with us a number of witnesses from the Construction Scotland Industry Leadership Group. Um, first of all, Ken Gillespie, who is the chair of the group, Anne Allen, MBE, who is a member of the group, and Ron Fraser, who is the executive director. So welcome to all three of you this morning. Um, the sound desk will operate the mic, so you don't need to press any buttons. And if you want to come into the discussion, just indicate to me by raising your hand. Um, I, I wonder if I could just start with some questions about the, the role and the, the structures of the committee. Um, could perhaps one of you provide us with an overview of these? Yes, I could certainly do that. Um, <coughs> perhaps before I do, I'd just like to uh, make a few opening remarks. Um, Normally, when we come in to talk about construction, we immediately focus on the challenges and the issues that the industry faces. And no doubt this morning we will come on to, to discuss that. But I just wanted to start by saying that the construction industry is a great industry. Uh, it does fantastic things. Um, and um, we deliver uh, wonderful projects throughout Scotland. Um, construction touches all of our lives, whether it's the, the houses that you live in or whether it's the... Um, schools, hospitals, or the roads and the bridges that we use to access our, our daily lives. Construction is, is very much the foundation of everything that we uh, do. Um, and from my perspective, um, having spent my whole life in the industry from leaving school into an apprenticeship at 17, I'm massively proud to be sat here today as Chair of Construction Scotland representing our industry. So I just wanted to make those uh, opening remarks. Um, Construction Scotland was established by Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise as one of um, the sector industry leadership groups um, with the objective of providing a, a space and a place for the construction industry to come together and communicate with its stakeholders, um, both clients, government uh, and the participants. And the objective was to um, establish a consensus across industry. Um, industry, construction industry, I'm sure you've found through your meetings, is a very diverse um, industry in terms of it, the, the various uh, professions, trades, and people who participate. And therefore, getting consensus across the industry to make um, the positive steps to provide solutions to some of our challenges was the main objective, to provide growth not only for the industry itself, but for the Scottish economy uh, as a whole. Um, Construction Scotland refreshed its strategy towards the end of last year, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you've all had the opportunity to at least receive uh, a copy of that strategy. It was 18 months worth of work um, where we uh, spent a considerable amount of time doing a very wide and deep um, consultation uh, across industry and all of our stakeholders to include um, our clients, uh, and government. Um, so from that perspective, we, um, we, we wanted to really land um, what were the key uh, issues for the industry in order for us to support the growth of a, uh, and development of more sustainable and productive, innovative, diverse uh, and profitable uh, industry. Um, the strategy that, that we published set out six um, key priorities and outcomes um, that we felt, or the industry felt, needed to be addressed. Um, procurement, skills, quality and standards, planning and building regulations, growth and productivity and innovation. And for each of those priorities, um, we've established a working group uh, and a chair for each of those working groups to drive forward the, the recommendations that have come from industry and to work with all our stakeholders to make, um, to take the steps and to deliver the actions that we, we feel as an industry are necessary to further develop and further improve 
uh, what we do. We've, e we've also, at either end of those six priorities, established two forums. Um, one is a customer forum, and, and Alan chairs that customer forum for us. Uh, and the concept is that we can take the work of Construction Scotland and we can um, test it against what our customers think uh, and whether or not uh, they support some of the initiatives or whether they want to amend, alter, or feed back into the industry uh, their perspective. At the other end, we have the Industry um, Representative Bodies Forum, where we um, communicate and, and consult with all the various trade bodies and federations in a similar way to, to ensure that um, we've got a real sense of um, whether we have consensus and whether or not the, the wider industry support the initiatives uh, that we are pursuing. Um, interrupt you there so you've got the priorities you set out and a working group for each priority you've got these um, forums so customer forum industry representative forum uh, I'm just trying to come back to my question here about how your structure um, is set up so the, the industry leadership group is is as it says in the tin it's drawn from industry leaders um, across uh, the wider Scottish industry. Um, those industry leaders, if you like, um, will chair and will participate in some of those working groups, as obviously Anne does. And as a group, yes, we in meet. In addition to that, yes, we meet. ILG meets um, at least four times a year, um, mm. to, to in a formal sense. Uh, and and do, you, do you keep minutes of these meetings? Yes, we do. And yes. are these public? Yes, they are. And are they online? Uh, yes, I believe they are. <coughs> We've got, our, we, our website is down at the moment, that's why I hesitate. Ah, okay. um, but the intent is for them to be publicly available, yes. Yeah. Right, so is that a temporary thing, the website yes, is down? Yes, yeah. Right, so I think Ron Fraser wanted to... I, I was just going to add to what Ken was saying there. The minutes are produced and circulated to all the members and to observers, so they go to... Scottish Government, go to Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, in our various representative bodies. The intention has been that we get them back up on the website so anybody can access them. We've been refreshing the website, but we will catch up with the last three or four meetings and put them on the website as well. So they are public and they're available for anybody to, uh, okay. to get copies of. And, and just to come back to what we were talking about, do you have a, a means whereby you ensure that all different types of those involved in the industry are represented on, on your group? For example, sole traders or SMEs? Yes, we, we, we have a, a maximum of 15, um, and we are drawing those from across the whole industry. So we've actually structured it in a way that we would have representation from SMEs, manufacturing, um, construction, supply chain, tier two, three, four, um, along with um, customers um, and industry trade bodies. So the objective, going back to the point about consensus, is to try as far as possible to get a true representation uh, across the breadth, um, not only in terms of the size and scale of businesses, but also in the geography of Scotland. Um, so trying to draw um, industry leaders from other parts of Scotland uh, into the group. All right, thank you. I'll now come to Andy Whiteman for further questions. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, turning to your strategy for 2019-22, this isn't your first strategy, is it? No, this is the second strategy. So um, what, how, how successful was the first one? I think in terms of, we, we, we published within the strategy the, the successes that we think that we uh, achieved first time round. Uh, and I think um, it would be fair to say that we've spent a lot of time um, driving the, the structure and the need to get consensus. So I would say that in the first part of our evolution, um, we've, we've done lots of, of good work, um, but a lot of time and effort has been spent on getting the organisation truly representative and getting the structure of it um, appropriate to, um, to ensure that we can get that consensus and we can get um, what we need to. But if you go to page five of our um, strategy, you'll find a, a summary of the positive difference that we think we've made for the sector um, along the way. I don't know whether you want me to, to cover any wondering, I mean, these are, these are statements, you know, you've, you're representing the industry, engaging the industry, leading a bid, developing, etc. Yeah. I mean, can you point to any 
uh, sort of practical examples to, as it were, justify the existence of Construction Scotland? I mean, strategies are often things that people do to make it look like they're busy and stuff. I'm not decrying the work you're doing, but but what, what can you practically point to that was is here in the construction sector now that wasn't before? Well, ob obviously, the establishment of the Innovation Centre uh, is, is perhaps the largest um, action, if you like, that's tangible and you can see in a physical sense. Um, so obviously, that was all about our productivity and innovation strategy around how we get the industry to, to innovate more freely. Um, so from that perspective, that was perhaps um, the, the biggest action that came out of the early years. Um, and obviously that's now established, and I know that the Innovation Centre are here in providing you with um, evidence. We've also um, been very active um, with on the planning and standards. Um, so so we've, we've consulted um, with government and the planning authorities and building control um, on a very regular basis in order to inform industry view um, of, of how that's been developing. And equally, we've been very, very active in the um, engagement with government around um, fire control um, for, for all the reasons that we'd all understand. So there are a number of areas where we've been extremely active in providing industry um, views on the best way forward. Ronald, I'm just going to add something to Ken. I mean, from my perspective, as a... <coughs> Sorry, a a long-term member of the industry. I think uh, we've often been criticised as an industry for being very fragmented, and that's quite correct when you see the number of different industry bodies that we can have that represent us. I think one of our, one of our successes uh, over the last few years, and certainly I think evidenced even in some of the reports that, that I've read from previous interview, interviews on this panel, is the bringing, the, the bringing together of so many of the industry representative bodies into one forum, just like this, round the table, uh, to debate common issues of concern to the industry. Now, um, just before Christmas, we had a meeting of our um, uh, industry representative bodies group, and we had 20 of the biggest uh, organisations round the table debating the industry and what we needed to do to, to help change it and, and, and pretty much agreeing with the strategy. And, for me, that's one of the one of the biggest successes. Is that it was, it was at the end of the day, the, the main reason I think for for having an organisation like us is to have, try and try and coalesce, trying to bring a, a very disparate industry together to give it a voice, almost like conducting the orchestra. So that, to me, is is one of the main successes that that, that we've had. And of course, that's not and that's that we've now got an, a, a client forum in our midst as well. So we have the opportunity to bring not only the industry together. Uh, but also to bring it together with its customers to discuss jointly what the problems are and how we, how we solve those problems. And in fact, that's been manifest now in meetings with Scottish Government as well at a, at a senior level. So I, that's, to me, one of the major successes. Okay, and you say about your, your new strategy that um, you talk about um, game changers. Um, and could you point to one of these six um, strategic priorities and give me an example again of the kind of practical um, outcomes you'd expect to have achieved by 2022, something that's tangible that we can look to. I think um, by, by, by far the biggest priority as we see it at the moment is the way that we do business in Scotland within the sector. Um, so we, we, we have that under the heading of procurement. Um, we've engaged, um, going back to your earlier question, we've engaged now for a number of years um, in consulting over the procurement reform. And we as an industry don't think we've gone nearly far enough um, in terms of uh, procurement reform. So um, to answer your question specifically, by 2022, I'd like to see us not procuring in Scotland um, on, a, on a project by project basis at lowest price. Um, I'd like to see us being far more strategic as a country in terms of how we make that capital investment in order to improve the economic outcomes um, and doing it in a manner that's consistent with um, the ability of the industry to, to gear up to create sustainable uh, factories, sustainable organisations um, and to be doing that with a, a real focus on reducing economic leakage um, and ensuring that we can 
present that work in a way that satisfies how we are as a country, both regionally and scale, so that we can really optimise and maximise um, our SME's opportunity to, to deliver on a regional basis uh, and to ensure that actually we're, we're making um, the best we can out of every pound invested in Scotland from a, a capital perspective. Back to procurement um, yep. just a little bit later on, but th thanks for that. Um, you also say in the strategy that um, the priorities will be addressed by an action plan. Um, is this in the public domain or is it in, still in progress being worked up? If I can answer that, I mean, the, the, the action plan is in draft uh, at the moment, um, and the reason for that is that we felt that although we as an ILG, or sorry, the ILG with my assistance could produce an action plan, which we have done, we felt that it was appropriate to get our working groups up and running and let the members of the individual working groups come up with their own individual action plans for their own areas. So we provided the draft action plan to our working group leads and said, look, this is some of the ideas that we could implement in each area. And then as each working group refines its thinking, you know, we, the, the procurement group are working at the moment on the issues that they want to take to the table. The same applies to quality, same applies to... So what, once we've coalesced them, then yes, we will publish that within the next few months. We'll, we'll be ready to publish the, the action plan. OK, thank you. John Mason. <coughs> Thanks, convener. Um, I wanted to um, move on a little bit to think about the Innovation Centre. It's already been mentioned. So I'd, maybe someone could give us a little bit of background about how the Innovation Centre came about. As I understand it, it kind of came out of Construction Scotland, but is now distinct. But I don't fully understand the relationship. So, so the Innovation Centre came out of um, the work of Construction Scotland in identifying how we can improve as an industry. Um, and the, we led, um, if you like, the submission to Scottish Funding Council at that time uh, in relation to establish the establishment of it with the clear objective of improving uh, innovation within the industry. Um, it, it, as an organisation, <clears throat> when it was formed, um, is a separate governed organisation um, and it engages uh, regularly with businesses to develop um, product services processes um, to improve the various parts of, um, of what the industry is doing. Um, so that's how they, they function uh, as an organisation. So they bring together the university um, uh, universities together with industry to look at distinct projects um, in terms of how we can change and improve uh, and develop what we're doing. A success, would you say? I think our, um, I think it's been successful in the context of what it does. So it very much is stimulating uh, innovation with those businesses. I think the the challenge that we are we are, if you like, giving it is we'd like to see it um, address some of the more large scale strategic um, objectives that we've set out within the the strategy, and do work on a on a pan Scotland basis in terms of how we might move some of our key priorities forward. So that's the challenge uh, that we have um, working together with them. And, and the relationship between you was close or um, Yes, I would, I would or? say that they, they participate um, in the ILG in every meeting. Uh, they also participate within our working groups. So they have complete visibility um, to the strategic direction of the organisation and, and, what in the, and how industry are thinking at any point in time. So yes, there's a close working relationship with the Innovation Centre. I mean, we, we got slightly conflicting evidence, I think, because a, on the one hand, the Innovation Centre seemed to be saying that there was a culture of open IP and sharing ideas. A, but we also had, a, I think from yourselves, in fact, the comment that a, some of the work being done was of a commercial nature and that prevented the dissemination of new ideas. I mean, is it a bit of both or how, how does... It... I, I think um, obviously uh, the Innovation Centre are not here to answer in detail for themselves, oh. but, but <clears throat> as I understand it, it depends on the um, contractual relationship that's sort of entered into between the parties and depending on what is being researched, some, some uh, companies, businesses, organisations might require 
uh, confidentiality agreements to be signed and therefore it's not so simple a matter as just telling the industry what's been discovered. And, and I can understand that where intellectual property rights might, might, might arise. There are other circumstances where the initiators of the research are happy for their findings to be made available and, and disseminated. And so, yes, certainly, in fact, after, after I uh, wrote those words, I think uh, uh, the Innovation Centre had a dissemination event, and I have to uh, acknowledge that, that they, uh, they had an event uh, about two weeks after the report went in, and uh, it was about uh, disseminating information on certain housing developments that had come on. And again, I assume because the originators of that research were happy for that to be the case. Our, our point is that sometimes uh, when we look at what, what they're able to tell us in the case studies, it's fairly, it's fairly light in, in information, and that usually is because until a certain period of time has, has elapsed, perhaps, that the, the information can't be divulged. But without looking at specifics of individual uh, contracts, it's difficult to know which ones would and which ones wouldn't. But, so some, are, some apparently are able to be released immediately, some are, have intellectual property rights that would require them to be uh, held back in detail for a, for a period of time. Okay, fair enough. Ms. Allen, can I ask you um, about the relationship between uh, both colleges and universities? Uh, and I realise, I think you're at Glasgow University, is that right? And as I understand it, Glasgow University is the only member of the uh, leadership group, um, but I'm not sure what the relationship is with the Innovation Centre as well between colleges and universities, if more of them are involved. Or if you don't know that, um, you, you can tell me that. So um, there is a large number of universities which partner with the Innovation Centre. How they develop those relationships is certainly out with my knowledge. Um, I leave that to our researchers who can deal with that. But if you look at the all of the information on the Innovation Centre, they call out the large number of universities that they partner with. And then, well, specifically then on the, uh, the leadership group, can you explain the relationship between do you kind of represent all the universities and colleges, or is it more just that it just happens to be Glasgow University that's involved? Um, I sit on the leadership group because I'm leading a very large and complex construction project, which is a billion pound spend over the next 10 years. So um, we've looked at that to try and be innovative around procurement. We've looked at that to try and <coughs> lead in terms of the way construction can be managed and how we get good quality product delivered. So I sit on that in that capacity rather than as a representative of the universities. Um, in pulling together the client forum that Ken has mentioned, what I'm trying to do to that with that, and it's still very much work in progress, is to bring together a collective group representing universities, representing health, representing a lot private sector as well. So representing all of those people who engage with the construction industry. Um, and actually, when you look at the diversity of the industry, that's, there's, there's challenges in just who you bring together into that group. But I sit, there, I sit there as somebody who is leading a construction project, as opposed to specifically a university. Well, I, it's pretty obvious the universities are doing quite a lot of construction, as, as far as I can see. And I mean, I think uh, Jackie Bailey is going to be asking more questions about that, um, about the procurement side. I mean, would you say the would you say the universities are kind of exemplars in the way that they do uh, innovation? And um, I believe that in Glasgow we are we spent a lot of time um, developing a strategy for how we would go out to the market. We spent a lot of time actually engaging with the market to understand what they saw um, a good client being. What were their challenges if we went out in down certain procurement routes? Because it's fine developing a strategy of how you're going to procure something, but if that if the industry can't engage with that, then then what's the point? And I think it was that understanding which led me to be very happy to sit on the leadership group. Um, so I think we are, but again, even if you look across the university sector, we all tend to, we exchange information, we share knowledge, but we still all go out to the marketplace independently in terms of procuring um, our buildings and our maintenance and all of those um, aspects of work which hit the construction industry. I mean, if I can just widen it out, as I think probably is my final question. Um, 
I mean, I can understand wh how the, the, both the leadership group and the innovation centre are engaging with some of the big players, and they are the ones who are looking at new ways of doing things. But it is an industry where there's so many small players, isn't it? And do, do you think are they engaged with both or either the leadership group and the innovation centre? Would you say? Yes, um, I think they're engaged with both actually um, for for different reasons, but. Um, we, we are very, very keen to um, have the SME participation. I mean, we have, a, we have a model, a construction model at the moment that has um, the large contractors, the tier ones, if you like, uh, sitting underneath clients, and then you have tier two, tier three, tier four. Um, that, that's the model today. It might not be the model tomorrow, um, but actually it's how we engage with each of those tiers and how we bring them into the process uh, of construction. So that's absolutely critical to uh, the outcomes on procurement fr from our perspective. Uh, and that may be brought about by, um, by designing a, a procurement going forward that's very, very specific about how we want to see uh, construction delivered and how we want to see those SMEs participate, um, which is not there at the moment. Um, so it's very much left to the uh, in the main to the um, the principal contractor to decide how he's going to do that. But I think there's an opportunity here uh, for us to um, to look at that and to see whether or not there's a better way uh, to do that. And I should add that um, in terms of making progress, since the publication uh, of our strategy, uh, we have now uh, agreed formal engagement meetings uh, with the Scottish Government uh, led by the uh, Procurement Directorate um, so we have started, I think we've, we've had um, two meetings now, um, where we've started to look at how uh, we can come together um, with government and with the stakeholders to see whether there's a, to explore a better way of doing that and a better way of involving uh, SMEs going forward. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Jackie <coughs> Bailey. I keep on the issue of procurement with you. Um, and I wonder if you could just give us um, what your view is of the headline challenges that the construction industry faces with procurement currently. I, I would start with how um, capital is invested. So um, I go all the way back to how we plan um, our projects, our infrastructure, and how we, we invest that money. And I think there's a, um, a challenge around the scale um, and the type of investment coming forward. So if you take um, if you take the size of Scotland and our capacity, if you bring a project um, like the Aberdeen Bypass to the market, um, what you actually do is you end up having to import a substantial <laughs> amount of resource um, to deliver that in quite a short period of time, um, which doesn't necessarily, well, doesn't provide sustainable um, a stable situation for the industry because it's actually having to pull a lot of resources in to do something very, very quickly, um, and then those resources just disappear again, dissipate. What we really want is we want to think about how we invest such that we can deliver these projects at the right scale against the right timeline to maximise product, factories, employment for Scotland, such that that's more sustainable in the longer term. So I think we, we start there. Once, once we, we establish the, the right way to, 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 to make that investment, it's then um, Scotland has this complete drive in the main um, for lowest price. Um, and there is a, a, a perception that um, if I've spent the least amount of money um, in some procurement competition, then that represents best value for the country. And I entirely disagree with that. Um, I think actually that can be can have the opposite economic effect, uh, and, and no doubt you'll you'll have seen the impacts of of what happens when um, contractors do things at the wrong price. Um, and you know, not only are, are the projects delivered um, poorly, um, that there, there are effects of um, companies going out of business, jobs being lost, um, and actually it's the economic impact. I think is is is, is the opposite of what we're trying to do. So I think it's about um, trying to get, get ourselves into a situation where when we design and, and, and we're calling for a substantial change on how we do business together, 
um, which isn't based on lowest price, but is based on a number of factors, a number of which I've touched on today. And to my mind, we should be looking at how we maximise economic impact from the projects we do, not just procure them at the lowest price. You talked about access um, to procurement for SMEs, just uh, it to, in response to a question from John Mason. I wonder whether you would actually highlight that as a specific issue you would want to take forward. Um, we, we have identified that within the strategy. Um, at the moment, the, the conversation we're having with government, um, which is early days, um, is around how we might require the construction industry to perform in Scotland and to require it um, to, to participate both regionally and in terms of scale with SMEs in a, in a more, um, shall I say, prescriptive way as opposed to um, not. Is, isn't it that, that tier one contractors are by and large huge, headquartered outside of Scotland, um, they use their own preferred supply chain and often actually don't give access to local SMEs for any of the big contracts that, that they engage in. Is that the nature of the problem we're having to address? I don't agree with that as an overview uh, at all. Um, I, and uh, I did my background, but I equally I equally have spent time in the local contractor, um, Morrison Morrison Construction, many years in Morrison Construction. Um, so from that perspective, what I'd say is that headquartered out of Scotland to me is not relevant. And what's relevant is how many people does that organisation employ on a sustainable basis, not just for a project, but is it is it based in Scotland? Does it recruit in Scotland? Does it have a Scottish business? Um, and there are many international companies um, who have a strong Scottish a sc strong Scottish base and workforce. Um, so from that perspective, it's about developing those. Um, now, in terms of SMEs, to, to my mind, SMEs are given the opportunity. Um, but because of the nature of the way we do business in Scotland, uh, the, the contractors are all driven, everyone's driven to the lowest price. So if the lowest price is going to come from somewhere outside Scotland or somewhere outside uh, Inverness, then that's what they're going to do, because that's, that's been the, the driver. Isn't it the case that tier one contractors, in order to make profits on what are quite tight margins, will squeeze everybody else in their supply chain? Do you want to come on? Uh, yeah. <coughs> if I can, yes. Uh, before I answer that, Point, Jackie. I was just, I was just going to say that um, um, we are conscious uh, of, as an industry, that uh, there's a gap between the, as you, as you would say, the top dozen, top 15 uh, international UK companies have a presence here in terms of size and capability, and the, if I can find the right word, indigenous Scottish uh, companies who stay, who've grown up within within Scotland. Part of what we've been arguing about in terms of economic leakage and how we approach the market is is to try and make sure that in future there are, there are more more Robertsons, more Morrisons, uh, able to break through. And one of the reasons why uh, some of the smaller companies haven't been able to break through is, has been the size and scale of some of the projects, which, to be fair to the Scottish Government, I understand why they've done that, because they wanted a particular uh, boost to the economy, and, and that was one way of doing it, was to get these big, big projects underway. But the net effect of that, perhaps, is that, is that there isn't any work for the smaller medium-sized companies to grow in. So that is one of the objectives of, of our engagement with Scottish Government will be to see how can we encourage uh, the... Because there are tier ones who are Scottish. I mean, yeah, I, can, I can think of Ogilvy's, Muir Construction, Hart Builders, just to name a few in the, in the Edinburgh area. So we do have that, uh, that layer of, of, of local Scottish companies. They're just not of the size of a, of, of, of a Balfour Beatty or, a, or, a, or, a, or an Interserve. Tier one contractors currently with SFT are not headquartered in Scotland ah, and well, not even you, based day to day you, in Scotland. You, you, you made the, the, the connection to the SFT there, which I think, yeah. uh, yes, I agree, because, the, because obviously the hub companies that were set up, went, you know, the, way they, the way they were procured would, would drive you towards a bigger, more experienced companies yeah. who have all the, the right skills. We, we, but we do see that need to bring people on and bring them up. Encourage the Scottish Government perhaps to break down the contracts from these kind of mega contracts into something that is more manageable. Yeah, I mean, th th there's, a, there's two aspects to that, though, I, ha I have to say. Um, yes, one way would be to break projects down to get things, but one of the other aspects of, of procurement that we haven't really covered 
for in my, I've got my list of wishes really, is that um, our industry is, is very bespoke, uh, very discreet, if I can put it that way. What I mean by that is that we have a lot of buildings that are designed individually, each one bespoke to a particular site. Uh, yeah, we won't look at this one, but uh, uh, e even a typical school, for example, might be designed exactly different from the next one along the road because of, because of various reasons. Different site, different design team, different needs. We then procure, even within the hubs, generally speaking, discreetly. So in other words, a, a contractor will get one project. They, they might know there's a pipeline of work coming, but they've no idea whether they're going to win the next project. And if they do win it, what type of project is it? So as a tier one contractor at whatever level, you really have no, no knowledge generally of whether you're doing a prison one week, next year it might be a secondary school, next year it might be a primary school, each of these projects have a, will have different design teams, different solutions, different technology. Now, the industry is often compared badly against uh, automotive or, or you know, air, aircraft manufacturers not being innovative and not investing. The, the big advantage that those organisations have got in those sectors is that they know what their product is going to be from one project to the next. So, sorry, excuse me, I'm getting dry. To come in as well, so it might be... Yep. You I, in there so I was just going to build on what you're hearing from Ken and from Ron is that macro position. Um, the industry can only deliver what the client asks for. Um, so the issue around whether it's lowest price or best value is a key issue. Um, and again, I'd come back to what we're doing in Glasgow, where we in a way, in a, in a sort of micro level, have tried to deliver across some of what Ken and Ron are saying. So we have Multiplex as our contractor. So yes, they are an international contractor, but actually they're using a Scottish team to deliver the buildings. Um, and they weren't the only contractor that we could have appointed, but we don't talk, to them, talk of them as a contractor. They are our delivery partner. We work with them. We expect them to show us innovation. I expect them to deliver quality. I expect to pay the right price for that quality. Now, what that does is that allows them, for example, to um, make sure they spend time going out to SMEs. They, they pride themselves in the percentage that they spend with SMEs. Um, there is some interesting definitions around SMEs, I know, which we, you know, they're not, they're not always the one-man band, but um, they, they look at how much spend they spend on SMEs at the moment. We're looking at, I think it's 24% on, on our contracts. Um, we also, so there are ways there that if you get your procurement right, if we are an educated client who is working with the construction industry, then actually in Scotland we have some real opportunities. The way we've set it up is allows us to look at how we drive economies of scale. So can we purchase certain items which will deliver, which we will use across multiple buildings? Um, we are designing bespoke buildings for each of ours in our major new campus. Um, but actually we can also share best practice and we can, you know, we, we can buy certain things, whether it's sinks, they don't have to be different in each building. You, so you can do some procurement. Um, where you deliver economy scale. What's going on at Glasgow University, we would say, is an exemplar and others could learn from. But, you know, if you think about yesterday's news headlines, or maybe it was the day before's, uh, about a primary school in Dumfries, where clearly quality has been driven out at the expense of cost, and that was an SFT government commission project. And, so and I, I, would, I would agree with you. So I, that's why I think there are three elements here. It is one about educating the client and the industry together to work in a different way in terms of what do I want? I actually just want prod buildings finished to quality on time. Um, but you also have to change culture and change processes. And I think that's what the leadership group of Construction Scotland can take that conversation forward in the industry. That's why I'm very pleased to be a part of that leadership group to build on that. But that's going to take time to make sure we educate. I look forward to seeing your conversations with the Scottish Futures Trust. Um, your statement of achievements for 2013-17 um, <laughs> in your, your strategy for then said you led and coordinated the industry input to the Scottish Government Procurement Review. Um, how do you think that went? 
Did it achieve change? No, I think, as I said in my opening comments, we don't think it's gone far enough. Um, and that's why we've recommenced um, these engagement meetings with government um, with a commitment to relook at procurement. So, um, you know, I think back in 2013, I think, is when that review started. Um, and the um, publications of some of the implementation we've just seen recently. Um, but we certainly feel that that falls short of the fundamental changes we think are required um, to improve what we do in Scotland. Um, so fundamentally, we, we think we need to relook at that um, together. Um, and that's what we, we, we've embarked upon. Uh, so, so when you say fundamental changes, are you saying there's a need for another review? Or are you saying the first review wasn't actually implemented? I, I think the first review identified all the key issues. Uh, so I don't think we're missing any of the key issues. Um, I think where we need to improve is implementing solutions. Um, Whose job is it to do that? Is it the Scottish Government? Or do you have a role? No, I think we definitely have a role. Um, and and we've, we, we've continued to work hard to try and influence the outcomes to that. And, and you know, there's lots of reasons why um, the Scottish Government have been unable to, 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 to go down that route. Um, some of it is to do with the legalities and... European law and all sorts of stuff. So, um, what what we are saying is, um, look, we we need to we need to all the key issues are there. What we need to do is find solutions uh, and then implement those solutions. So, really, action the changes necessary to improve what we do. I wasn't aware of any legal issues acting as impediments to the Scottish government. But if you are, perhaps you could write to the committee about those. Um, one of the recommendations of the review was the appointment of a chief construction advisor, something I think the Scottish Government um, rejected. Do you think a chief construction advisor would be useful? I think, um, I think any um, central individual uh, or organisation that can pull all the strands together um, is absolutely beneficial. And certainly that's what we at Construction Scotland, that's our, our main objective, is to pull the industry together, achieve consensus on what the solution is, and then implement the solution. So any any move towards providing the industry with a central focus in order to um, to get the necessary action with government would all obviously be welcomed. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Convener. I think Andy Whiteman had further questions. Yes, thanks. <coughs> Convener, I just want to move on to talk about the Scottish National Investment Bank. But before I do, um, and you said just a minute ago that industry can only deliver what the client asks for. I wonder, um, in relationship to house building, Ken, I think you're chair of Homes for Scotland. One of the peculiar features of the British house construction market is that the majority of it is speculative, so there is no client, um, whereas most of continental Europe, more than 50%, is driven by clients. Um, so I'm wondering how we can improve the client experience in new house building I think in terms of house building in Scotland, um, there's a considerable amount of uh, housing delivered in Scotland um, for housing associations as clients. So I think in Scotland we actually do deliver a lot of housing um, to, to the customer's specification. Um, in terms of how we improve uh, the customer experience in, in house building, um, we, we as a, if I talk as a house building industry, we are, we are driving um, the changes we think are necessary to improve that. Now, um, from that perspective, you'll, you'll know that uh, we introduced the, the Five Star Quality Award um, from south of the border into Scotland. So that's now a new accreditation that Scotland didn't have um, that we've introduced uh, so that our um, house builders in Scotland are equally measured uh, as, the, as the rest of the UK are to improve... Uh, the quality of, of what they deliver for the customers. So, I mean, buildings that go up here in this city, for example, public buildings will be procured by public authority. Office buildings uh, will be procured by uh, some some investor or, or a client, Waverley Court or whatever. But housing will be procured essentially by um, by nobody. The, the, the body that builds it sells on as a product. So I'm just wondering how we can get clients more involved in the design and 
um, specification of the homes they're actually going to build, live in long before they actually buy them. Well, the, 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 the house building industry is a, is a retail business. Um, so they are um, developing products uh, and building. Uh, can change that, given that on the continent of Europe it's not a retail business. You have a very vibrant house building industry, but they're building it predominantly um, driven by clients who've procured it, often in volume themselves, but they're driving it. Well, they're, they're developing what, what they believe their customers want, because otherwise, if they didn't develop what their customers want, they wouldn't sell any houses. They'll only buy it because that's all that's available. Well, I, I think the, 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 the range of product um, available within Scotland um, is vast, so... Um, th th there are clients get more involved, but maybe we can have that conversation yeah. another day. Um, moving on to the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, we're about to scrutinise the legislation that will set that up, and government's been doing a lot of thinking on the purpose of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, I'm just wondering, given that you're recognised as the industry lead body for construction, have you had any conversations with government about the Scottish National Investment Bank and what it might do? Yes. Um we um, have been particularly focused on the, um, the need to stimulate uh, new entrants uh, and the need to stimulate and support the SMEs. Um, so um, the conversation we've had is around uh, the investment bank offering a different um, proposition to what's available in the market at the moment. A lot of the industry... Um, complain that it's very difficult to access um, finance, particularly given the, uh, the deep recession we went through and the, the banking crisis. So the constraints um, that the retail banks now have on, on borrowing uh, makes it very, very difficult uh, for smaller businesses um, to, to get the funding they require to really um, develop their business. So um, the conversation that we've been having, uh, Andy, is focused more around the smaller scale businesses um, and how they can access capital. And, you know, again, just, just really asking that the investment bank be set up in a, in a way that differentiates itself from mainstream borrowing, such that it can be patient capital and that it can have a focus on how we improve Scotland um, and, and have some structure around that so that it's actually a, a, an added value as opposed to just an alternative source uh, of finance. So can you say a little bit more about uh, what, what this capital is for? Well, you... it, it varies, obviously, depending upon what part of the, the sector you're in. So if, if you were a, a small construction business, it would be working capital. Um, is it the Scottish National Investment Bank providing working capital to SMEs? Well, what, what, what I'm saying is that what, Scotland, what I think Scotland needs is... Um, is finance that would stimulate the smaller organisations. So if you take um, if you take the house building that you touched on earlier, um, house building is a very capital intensive um, uh, part of the industry. So you know they'll buy land and invest um, for three, four, five years um, before they'll see income coming back in. So that's where I talk about patient capital is that um, in order to to get more entrance into that market. Um, I think there's an opportunity there for the investment bank to, to take a longer term view uh, and to also look at the, the cost of capital uh, to these smaller businesses. Um, so, you know, that, that's where I think um, there's an opportunity for Scotland um, is, to, is to support the SMEs, to support uh, new entrants and to develop those um, smaller businesses and, and into medium sized businesses and to create uh, economic growth through it. Ron, you wanted to I, say? I was just going to add that there, there is maybe a, a also a, a, a bigger role if we look at the if, well we don't obviously looking at the news we don't know what's going to happen but uh, if the European Investment Bank was to disappear from the from the landscape then you know perhaps there's a role for the Scottish National you know, and, and the Scottish Bank to uh, look at uh, lending to some of the bigger projects as well that's the, that was the point I was going to make. Okay, so I'm, I'm just seeking to explore the conversations you've had with government rather than your particular preferences, because we all have preferences. Um, that The bank is expected to have a, a very mission-orientated approach. Indeed, Scottish government published a, or were presented with a paper uh, the other week um, looking at this. Do you expect construction as a whole to play a, a, a big role in that, possibly tied to the kind of procurement reforms you were 
alluding to earlier? We, se we certainly uh, believe it's an opportunity for the sector um, to be supported, yes. In, in any particular ways beyond what you've just touched on with the SMEs? Just in the context of, of um, making available investment in finance that's currently not available. But this finance is, is, is available from clients. I mean, clients are procuring buildings but and roads and infrastructure. Yeah. So that capital is available. You're talking about the capital requirements from the, uh, from the industry's point of view. Well, I, th I think um, there's a delay um, in payment cycles. So, so you, you still need to have the ability to, to fund that initial work, albeit you're quite right, um, that, that um, construction contracts in the main are paid for uh, by a regular payment stream. But there is still a, um, a, a capital requirement to, to be able to um, either start or to grow um, as you increase the volume of work you do. The, the, the resources um, are, are the cash requirements are much greater and obviously in the house building side of things um, uh, the, 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 the finance is just not frankly available from commercial banks at uh, appropriate rates to allow um, small home builders to um, develop and, and we desperately want to encourage more small scale home developers um, to develop businesses in Scotland. Okay, thank you. I'll just finish off by, by inviting you, therefore, to um, submit evidence to this committee. I think we're um, seeking evidence on the Scottish National Investment Bank bill till the 3rd of May. So, a month to get some views in. That'd be useful. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Tom Mason. Yes. Um, can I f now focus on retentions and payments? It's been suggested that the uh, retention of um, re capital retentions in terms of pro projects is past its sell-by date. Uh, do you agree with that? Um, yes, uh, I do. Um, I think as an industry we do, but I think we have to... Uh, uh, we, we've had this debate with around, around the table at the ILG. We would all like to see them ended. Um, but I think there's a little bit of pragmatism has to come in because we know that some people... In the, in the industry still uh, worry uh, that they won't get the quality of their uh, buildings and projects delivered if they don't hold some kind of retention on their subcontractors or on their main contractors, because this happens from clients down. So what we've been doing is saying to, uh, to, to, uh, to our industry members that what we need to do is come up with the alternatives to retention, i.e. What, what is the alternative model that will be acceptable to uh, uh, clients and one of the one of the roles that Anne's uh, um, um, client forum will, will give us is a chance to test some of the alternative ways in which surety can be given on to, to clients that their projects will not be completed with defects that they have no means of bringing the contractor back to fix. So obviously the answers to removing retentions uh, completely, which is what we would love to do very, very soon, the, the answer is to make sure that we have in place the necessary quality assurance measures in, in all cases to make sure that the work is actually being done uh, if, you know, in accordance with the contract and completed with you know, as little defect as possible at, at, at the handover date. So yes, as an industry leader, we would like to see retentions end, but we, we understand that that, that will require a little bit of effort into the what what alternative method, method methods would be needed. This alternative method is likely to be likely to be. Well, are we still at the beginning of that process, or are we somewhere? No, no. That may, I mean, there are there are a number of uh, you know tested ways or alternatives to retentions that are used in other jurisdictions, and, and some clients already uh, use a variety of, uh, of techniques. There was a a big paper done by uh, uh, an organisation called Pi Tate. Uh, a couple of years ago for the UK government identified a whole range of uh, alternative measures. The, the, the issue we have in the UK is that because re the use of retentions is a historic thing, it's been going you know, since uh, the 1890s or even be probably even long beyond that. It's an, it's an old thing and a way of just retaining a small pot of money. When I say small, it could be 5%, which could be more than the profit on a job. It, retaining a sum of money to then be used to encourage the contractor to return. Um, 
the problem we have is that we don't have much evidence and experience of how the alternatives really work in practice. And so um, I, I know that there's a further research programme at the moment going on, which the Scottish Government have commi commissioned PyTate to look at for us, to look at to see what experience there is of the alternative methods and uh, hopefully make a recommendation that we, could, that, we can, that we can all settle around that says end retentions, but what we're going to do is we're going to use whether it's performance bonds, whether it's uh, bank guarantees, whether it's just more sophisticated digital quality assurance techniques. You know, there are a number of ideas around that might help to give confidence, because at the end of the day, this will be about giving confidence to all customers, both public and private, that they can dispense with the need for retentions without worrying about the performance of their, of their contracts. And do we have time scale on this? Um... Uh, the, well, I think the the, uh, the Pi Tate report is due to report uh, within the next few months, and uh, Anne, I'll ask you what you know what, what your thinking is in terms of being able to get uh, clients to uh, the table around the, around this point. So I think getting clients to the table will take some time to have that conversation. I would look at it from the I would turn the lens the other way, and say actually the conversation we need to have is how we make sure that we get the right quality of build. Because if we know that, therefore, the retention issue becomes a much lesser issue. So working through Construction Scotland, we will be talking about, one, how you monitor construction, particularly using digital, through um, the construction process. So it's the bits that you don't see that are important to me, um, to make sure that we actually start to deliver high quality buildings, which is what I think everybody wants. Um, and that will then, at the same time, allow us to have a different conversation around retention. We'll put those methods in place. Quite frankly, it will take time, because it takes time to build buildings. It will take time to evidence whether or not things like the digital um, records are meeting our needs. And all of this around construction takes time, because buildings take time to build. Okay. Now, what about payments in terms of late payment? Do you think that, that any progress is being made then? And what is the role of the public sector in this? I'll, I'll pick this one up as well. I, th I, think, I think progress has been made on the late payment. Um, I think there's, there's an issue in the industry of, defi of differentiating between late payments and non-payments or, or, or payments being held back for reasons either commercial, contractual disputes, uh, defects or whatever. In many cases, payments are, are, are being held back, we believe, not simply because somebody wants to hold on to the money, but because a proportion of the payment they think is not due to the, to the party. And sometimes it's quite hard to differentiate the two issues when you're discussing payment. If we're talking about payments being made where there's no dispute and there's no, there's no issue, there's no defects, there's no argument about the payment, it's being processed in accordance with the contract and everybody's happy with it, we went through, we did go through a bad patch a few years ago when some quite big companies were deliberately holding on to cash and resulting in payments being delayed. A number of initiatives by government to report on payment terms and by the industry itself to, uh, to, to, to do surveys and to start flagging up, like Build UK, for example, have all their members reporting on their payment terms. Uh, I think that is beginning to turn around the pure time scale issue, if I, meet, if, I, if I can differentiate that from the dispute issue. Um, I think the, the time scale issue is getting better, much better. Um, and one of, the, one of the facets, I think Select did a survey of their members uh, recently, and uh, although they did report some delayed payments over, over term, actually uh, an interesting point was that quite a number of their payments, I think almost 70%, I think they were, they were quoted as coming from clients, not from, not from tier one or, or contractors. So, that there, is, that there is still an issue, uh, but it's an issue that's, that applies right from the top, right, right down through the, through the industry. But I think it is getting better as a result of various measuring techniques that have been introduced and, leg and statutory legislation. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, it's really, really important that we differentiate between normal payments and those payments that are in dispute. And that takes me full circle to procurement review, because the reason that, that these payments get stuck comes back to um, the way projects are procured. So I just want to make the point that the ma majority payment is talked about in, in, in terms that are not necessarily fully understood. And as Ron says, our experience is the majority of issues come from how we do business together. 
In relation to payment timescales or normal cycle, um, you'll see from our strategy that Construction Scotland have a stated intent to get that back to 30 days. And again, you need to be very careful about how you measure that 30 days because all the, the various contracts are different. But at the moment, going back to, to Ron's point, um, the uh, UKCG uh, did an did a exercise recently, and I think their membership, uh, which is very substantial across large and small contractors, their, their average period for payment was at 43 days. So I, I concur with Ron that we're seeing the industry pull that back. Um, and just building on Anne's point, um, I just think that the conversation around retention is a great example of how Construction Scotland wants to operate, because the contracting industry all want retention abolished and tomorrow. Uh, and being able to take that to our customer group to say, look, this is what your contracting industry are saying they'd like to do, and the customer group are able to come back and challenge the industry, say, well, hang on, I think we've got a bit more work to do on quality um, before we'd be confident. Uh, and obviously, we'd want to look at other options. So I just think it's a great example of how the industry can come together and, and, and discuss the solutions amongst itself uh, and then promote those. Is the leadership do, group doing enough to achieve that, that conversation? We could always do more, um, so, so we should never say yes. Um, ideas to put into the, into the pot to, to discuss? Well, I think, as, as Ron says, we're exploring what the, the various options could be, because I think there's two issues on retention. There's the security of retention, which is clearly you know, a fundamental mm. issue and one that um, we think um, need, can be addressed regardless, mm. is the security of retention, i.e. what would happen if a client or a contractor were to go out of business. You know, it's, it must be wrong that that money's lost. Um, but equally, you know, what are the alternative methods to... Well, one, industry, want, we need to drive our, our strategic objective of improving quality. But, but on that journey, what are the other methods um, that we could come up with to give the security uh, that our clients want, that the, that the quality will be delivered and that they'll be responsive in the, in the context of any potential defects? I don't know if there's anything to add to that. Right? No, no. I, 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 well, I'll just add, I think, as, as, as Ken said, it wanders into the procurement arena, but it also goes back into the quality aspect. And uh, we didn't say earlier that what the two big themes that are coming out that, that we're pursuing with Scottish Government in our, in our uh, liaison meetings now, uh, one is procurement, and we've talked that quite a lot in this meeting, but the other is quality. Um, and I think the industry does recognise that for a number of reasons, part, partly to get rid of retentions, partly to just uh, you know, regain the trust uh, in some areas that, that uh, the industry needs to demonstrate that it, that it takes quality assurance seriously. And one of the key areas for we're seeing the development of digital technology is in, is in the area of quality management, where some of these bigger companies that we've talked about earlier are adopting digital techniques that will give them much more assurance of the quality they're delivering. Um, we, we have a working group under Construction Scotland where we bring uh, the professions and the various levels of contractor together in the, in, in the industry to debate how best to make sure that everybody uh, gains, a, gains a, a access to these technologies and techniques and ideas that are being implemented by the bigger companies. So we were trying to get uh, case studies and things developed to cascade it down so the whole industry benefits from the, the thinking of the, of, the, of the larger companies. And the, the larger companies are willing to, to do that and we've continued to, to implement those ideas. And that's part of our strategy to, to demonstrate to customers that the industry is taking its quality mission seriously and is, is developing techniques to make sure that it doesn't have the problems that we've seen in the recent past again. Just, yes, just, just um, build on that very on your question there around is construction the leadership group doing enough in terms of those conversations? What I would say to this committee is that we're all doing this off the side of our desks. We are all. It's not not the day job as such having these conversations. So anything that can um, support more research into some of this anything that can give a bit of support into the leadership group to um, give us a bit more time to have those conversations would, I think, help move those conversations on more quickly.
Thank you. Um, just on the retention point, Mr. Fraser, you talked about other tested ways used in other jurisdictions, but I don't think you gave any specific example. I mean, you refer to bank guarantees, but a, a small construction company is not going to get a bank guarantee, certainly not at a, an affordable level if it doesn't have a track record and finance behind yeah. it. So how, how is that going to work? That, 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 is, that is true, and um, I think, but I think there are a number of other softer ways of, of, of ensuring that. And those things could be, for example, um, where there's a longer-term relationship between the between the, the, the client and the customer. Then the uh, the customers can then, uh, having worked with a con with a contractor over a number of projects, perhaps, can uh, understand that, that 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 the way that contractor operates is such that they they, they will honour the, the the terms of their contract without the need for retention. So we see retentions go when there's a longer-term relationship. And that, came, that comes back to the point I was trying to get to when I got dried up earlier about uh, uh, the, the, the projects being discrete. If we could get more repeatability of, of, of contracts, more, more longer-term relationships between contractors and consultants, that helps. Not more points. likely to be larger companies, though, that would be in a position to take advantage of that. Not, not, not if we set up the, uh, the, the procurement, back to Ken's point about the, the, the economic leakage, if we set the procurement models correctly to take account of the needs of the country in terms of geographic and in terms of size of project, um, you can arrange for even small comp companies to have repeat business with the same under the same contract. Uh, that is one method of ensuring that you don't ha that you've got loyalty, if you like, both ways. That they, they both rely on one another, the client and the contractor, and, and that relationship then dispenses with the need for uh, for retentions. Um, the, that, as I said. Quality management, quality systems, evidence gathering, data, digital evidence of compliance is an obvious uh, way of ensuring that people have confidence that their work will be right first time and will be zero defects free when you complete. And that is the one that the industry generally is focusing on, I think, is mainly as it's trying to reinforce the, the quality assurance technology. Other, other countries, I mean, do we have the enforcement uh, mechanisms that other countries do in terms of it's not just... Um, construction that takes time, it's also adjudication, court cases, whatever, can take time. Whereas in other countries, just to give an example, if a three-month period fix the defects or the uh, customer is entitled to do it and deduct that from the contract price, and then the, the com company, construction company can have a, a dispute in court about the money, but the customer has the uh, what they contracted for and they can get on with life. We don't have that in this country. So um, do we do we have the enforcement well, we mechanisms to we actually do, do that quickly? We do have adjudication um, mechanisms that can be used. We have adjudication, but do we have adjudication that can actually deal with things quickly? Ah, uh, you jump in. Uh, yeah, so most, um, <coughs> and this is, this is where you, you get into a level of detail, but uh, most standard forms of building contract um, or construction contract will have a defects obligation in law, mm. which will require the contractor to perform against a specific timeline and will give the client the ability, as you say, to employ others um, to carry that work out. And then they can dispute that um, if they want to at some future date. But the, but, but the building, the, the, the project gets completed um, to the satisfaction of, of the customer. We have that remedy today. Um, I can't think of any contract in my lifetime where that remedy wasn't there. It's been in basic um, forms of contract for, for all of my career. Um, so that remedy exists today. Um, so, so why if that remedy exists and it's effective and it can be dealt with quickly, do we have a problem with retentions being capped? I think that's, um, well, that, that's a, a reflection on, on the fact that retentions came into place historically. They've been there for a long time. Um, one might look at them and say they're a, a cash flow benefit um, to the customer. Um, so why would they want to give that up um, if, it, if it's custom and practice? Um, I think the, the, the alternate side of that coin is does the, does the construction industry respond as positively and as quickly uh, as it should in the dealing with defects, particularly at the end of the defects liability period where, where everyone's moved on to another project? Um, well, we've got challenges there. We need to improve at doing that. Um, but in terms of um, customer remedy, customer remedy is there. Um, 
the preference clearly is to, to uh, the, the fact that there's tensions there to pay for that. So if they do go away and employ someone else to do it, they've got the funds to pay for it in the meantime whilst they um, resolve their differences. Um, but, but the more important point to make is that, goes back to my point on procurement, right? Um, there are many clients today who don't hold retention. And it goes to Ron's point about how we do business together. So if I, if I give you the example of um, the, the, the water business in, in England, the water business in England has been in long-term relationships with its supply chain for coming up for 30 years. It was one of the first sectors to recognize the benefits of um, a different way to procure. Um, so that sector has, inclu has involved, um, it's involved its SMEs, it's involved its manufacturing base to the extent that a single manufacturer might have a, um, a high supply into, into their work. They've brought their work to market in five year intervals. So there's an opportunity to create sustainable business. And because it's a five year relationship, uh, and some of those relationships have, have ran for 25 years, um, there's an absolute two-way trust and commitment um, that that relationship will deliver on all of the defects management and the issues and they get resolved. A lot of the, the debates we have come back to the fact that um, customers procure projects on a one-off basis in a single relationship never to be repeated at the lowest possible price. And that doesn't create the right environment or the best environment, the optimum environment for the relationship to, to, to get the best out of um, what's possible. But that, that would never be possible to be completely eliminated, surely? Sorry? Y you wouldn't ever be able to eliminate that completely because there will always be one-off contracts, will there not? I mean, I, I take what you're saying about you know, well, large private bodies or public bodies might be able to look at things in the way you're saying generally, but there will always be one-off contracts, one would have thought. Agreed, but yeah. um, there is a huge opportunity um, for projects to be brought to market in a far more joined up way um, in order to create the environment I've described. Um, there's, you know, there, there's no, there, we're procuring one-off projects at the moment that would be far better served uh, in a programme of work over a longer period. Mason, perhaps come back in. How, how do you think you can achieve that? I mean, I, I understand the dream of, do, of doing that. You know, the, the country spends X, X billion pounds every year on a regular basis for 10, 20 years. But how, how are you going to manage that? Who's going to manage that process? Well, our, our, our aspiration um, is through our conversation with government is to um, develop a, a, an understanding of the benefits of that approach. Um, We've seen a lot of traction in England now. So government in England are bringing together all their purchasers um, and they're beginning to require them to, um, to bring their projects um, to market together in a manner that requires them to, um, to perform in a particular way, including off-site uh, manufacturing, including uh, sustainability in relation to employment, including innovation. So, so um, central government at the moment have started that process through the, um, the development of the CLC. So um, it is possible to, to bring those spending profiles together and to, and to explore how we can maximise sustainable economic benefit for Scotland through the way that those um, programmes are brought to market. Ron, is there anything you want to <coughs> Sorry, it's, no, to do carry on. it's yes. perhaps worth mentioning again that what, uh, as part of the discussions with Scottish Government, the procurement joint working group that we're setting up has a subgroup on frameworks. Yeah. And the idea of that is to look at how we can um, test some of the, 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 the ideas that we have on better procurement uh, through uh, frameworks that Scottish Government might set up. Um, and the, the, the concept there is that frameworks, if they're done properly, can take account of the, uh, the, the, the differing needs of different parts of the country, can take account of different sizes of project, and can allow a variety of companies of different sizes and scale to get some of the benefits of repeatable work under, under, a, under, a, under a single contract so they don't have to keep bidding for things all the time. Um, so part of that will be 
linking into the quality assurance, linking into ways of getting rid of retention. So it, it is part of the discussions that, we're, that we, we're having and will be having with Scottish Government about how we can actually end these things and fit them into this model of a series of frameworks. Right, thank you. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to look a little bit uh, at public support for the sector. Does the construction se sector get the same level of business support, including financial support, from public sector bodies as other sectors do? And if, if so or if not, what kind of support should they be getting? So, um, my observation, um, having come into the chair, um, is that there's a huge amount of support given to the industry. Um, and what we need to get better at is um, coordinating that and collaborating on it, such that we get the outcomes that that level of investment deserves. So, um, from that perspective, you know, we, we, we see, my, my observation is I see lots of initiatives um, in um, isolation. And what I'd really like to see us do um, is pull that together between um, government um, and, our, and the industry to say, look, we're, we're, we're working really hard and there's clearly quite an investment going into various parts of the industry. Can we just get that coordinated uh, in a manner such that um, we get better outcomes from that investment? So I don't sit today saying um, that, that we're not supported as a sector. I think we are. Um, I just think we could we can improve the outcomes from that support. And my my, my example would be um, would be skills, um, where um, we've got the CITB, uh, who, uh, on behalf of industry, are investing um, substantial sums of money into this in, into uh, the sector. Um, we've got Skills Development Scotland, who who equally uh, are working hard on our on our behalf, um, but I still see uh, lots of little initiatives running around um, that would be better harnessed under one umbrella. Um, and I also see a disconnect between um, the um, educating authorities, um, that investment and jobs. So I, I would really like to see that um, joined up such that we're taking um, youngsters um, we're making the opportunities available to them and then we're putting them uh, into a job at the end of it uh, so that the employers are, are at the end of that process and that the, they're not disconnected. So I think I think the support is there, um, but I think we need to, to coordinate it better. Construction Scotland in the skills area are trying to do that through an outreach programme called Inspiring Construction. So um, that's a programme where we're working with CITB and Skills Development Scotland to try and coordinate our effort in schools, particularly in S3, S4. Um, we'd really like to get to primary schools, but that's a, a bit away um, because we do need to attract um, more um, diversity and more people um, into the industry for the future to deal with the, the challenges we're going to have. Um, and it's a great example where there's lots of effort from various bodies going on, but let's pull it all together and let's get around the table and really make a difference and really get jobs at the end of that process um, as opposed to having them um, separated, if that makes sense. You're talking about disconnects. Do, do you see that as your role to bring all that together? I see it, I see it as Construction Scotland's role to, um, to inform the debate and to actually express um, industry's view on how we best get youngsters back into the industry and into jobs. Um, because the industry, at the end of the day, are, are the organisations who are going to employ these people. Um, so, so we've got public investment and support going into that um, pipeline. But are we doing it in the right way to get real jobs out the other end? But surely there's going to have to be, at some point, some coordinating body that's going to bring together the disparate uh, efforts and so on that are going on out there in the market. You talk about disconnects. If there are disconnects, it's not going to—they're not going to heal themselves without some force behind it. So, 
So there's two, there's two things. There's our inspiring construction programme where um, we are trying to pull industry, because industry as well individually are, are substantially investing on their own initiatives. And what we're trying to say to industry is, look, can we all do this in the, in the one place um, with a common message and a, and, a, and a common ask? So we're doing that with industry. We're doing that with Skills Development Scotland, CITB, and indeed the schools that we, we are outreaching to on a regular basis at the moment. So we are trying to do that uh, and pull and grow that community into one uh, within Inspiring Construction. But we've equally got our Skills Working Group, um, which, are, are, which are seeking to, to widen that beyond just the Inspiring Construction programme. So that, that is something that we're trying to do at the moment. I'll just add, I mean, I, I take the point, obviously, at the end of the day, Construction Scotland doesn't have the power to, 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 to order, reorder the, the, what we might see as the, as the disjointed nature of the, of the support that's being provided in these areas. But I think what we're saying is that we think it's our job to highlight that, identify it, work with industry and government to try and identify solutions. And then, you know, if, if, if when, when, we, when we've identified a solution to that, then, then to put pressure on to make sure that that solution is implemented by, it would have to be government, I would guess, to, to pull all the, the, the strands of the organisations that we're talking about. But as Ken says, this isn't just a government problem. It's, uh, the industry is just as disparate in its approach to uh, the, the school population, for example, in terms of skills. And so there's a combined role, combined responsibility here, I think, between uh, industry, its clients and the government to find a way to make the money that we are spending on this whole skills sector much more, uh, much more uh, uh, beneficial to, 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 to delivering the diverse workforce that we want in the future. And, and see, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of things going on, but not very connected together at the moment, is what we think. To me, it doesn't seem, as you say, it's all very connected. And it doesn't seem that there's really that forum there that's going to pull it together and make it happen. It sounds like it's more hope that people will come on board than anything else. I, I would, I would, I would disagree. Uh, if only because we've been um, we've been pleasantly surprised at the at the level of collaboration that we get from government, and in fact the the joint construction Scotland Scottish government uh, um, forum that, that we've talked about a couple of times here. Uh, only had a couple of meetings, but we've set up. Uh, uh, we're going. We're set, we're in the process of certainly working groups and procurement working groups on quality and skills as part of that quality subset as well. So we will be raising it with Scottish Government and at these meetings. And so, you know, we are hopeful that that, that will lead to the kind of, uh, you know, to, to a listening ear that, that takes on board the, uh, the, the things that we're suggesting need to be done. Could but, Colin, I've, I've perhaps not been clear in my response. Um, the Skills Development Scotland and CITB, which are the main two, two main bodies that support us, the industry in terms of skills are do attend the uh, ILG meetings. So they are part of our regular sit down at that level, at a strategic leadership level. They equally participate within our um, inspiring construction programme. Uh, and indeed that programme is actually funded by CITB. Um, so, so we are beginning to pull it together. Um, and equally our skills working group uh, we'll look to develop that beyond just the inspiring construction, which at the moment is focused at uh, school leavers. Um, so, you know, I am positive that we are actively doing that today. Um, we've got a long way to go. It sounds like, you know, engaging with the government and so on is perhaps the easy side of it. Getting, pulling together all the disparate uh, companies and businesses within the construction centre sounds like uh, a bit like herding cats from what you're saying. It, it, it is, but uh, again, I'll, 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 do, I'll doff my hat to, to my colleague from the, from the client sector here, because, I'm, because at the end of the day, we feel that the, the, most, the strongest way of pulling them all together is that most of these companies and organisations, whether they're you know, a construction company at tier one or every level, or whether they're a local subcontractor, whether they're an in, a professional body, um, they're, they're, they're going into schools and doing things in some cases because of a community benefits requirement in their contract or because of some uh, overarching reason from, the, from, their, from their own sustainability policies that they want to do this. And so what we're saying to, to customers is um, if we can develop this standardised approach to this, not stopping people doing their own thing, but saying if you are going into a school, no matter what bit of the industry you are, please give the standard 
little bit of information on all the range of careers that's available, what the routes and paths into those things. If we start with the clients and we can get the clients on board and the clients are saying to their contractors, you, when you're doing your community benefits to get a tick in the box with your contract, please give the Construction Scotland briefing, uh, which, which is standard now throughout the whole country. That, that's one way of making sure that it, our, our aim ultimately in, in the new process would be to make sure that every secondary school in, in Scotland gets the same message at some point during the year that, that look at the range of careers that are available. Uh, it's very, very, uh, you know, it, 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 it covers everything from the lowest level of qualification to the highest. It's, it's um, what's the word, Dan? I'm, run, I'm rushing out, I'm running out the word there, but it's, um, I think, uh, I think what we're saying about our industry is that uh, it's, it, it's, it's one way of driving inclusive growth. That's the word I was trying to get to, because uh, as an industry, we, we employ a vast array of different levels of skill, and sometimes that message is not out there in the schools and when they're, when they're directing children to look at careers, we don't they don't necessarily see that there is this wide range of capability that we, that we need in the industry. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so if we can get customers to help us and they can drive that down through their supply chains, then I think we have, uh, we have a good chance. Let me just ask a final question. It's probably inevitable that this is asked. How are you helping the sector prepare for Brexit? <laughs> well, I mean, um, it's a real challenge. Um, I think the, the, the issue for construction um, is threefold. Um, one is that the uncertainty um, is undoubtedly affecting investment, um, decision-making around whether or not to, to proceed with a project, whether or not to proceed with a purchase. Um, so... Uh, from that point of view, um, difficult for us to adjust to deal with that, but obviously a concern around uh, pipeline and workload um, as a result of that. Um, I think when you then go into what what we we can do um, is the two the two issues um, that, that would affect us most are um, people uh, and the fact that we uh, do rely upon. Um, uh, people from out, outside Scotland coming here and, and working within our, our industry. Um, and obviously that's a challenge for us, particularly um, with a declining uh, workforce anyway in terms of ageing and this drive to get uh, younger people back in to stimulate it. And equally, um, and, and, I've, and I've talked a bit about the real drive to get um, uh, people back into the industry. So, so that's what we're trying to do about that is actually get um, local population to be much more aware of the opportunities within construction so that we can we can get a, a better flow of people through. Um, the other issue for us is that um, some of the materials that go into our projects come from Europe, and I think there's a concern around um, whether or not we'd have delays um, and or uh, cost pressures um, as a result of that, and certainly... Um, some of the industry uh, have been trying to bring those products uh, forward um, and, and, and have them available earlier than we would otherwise bring them in, such that they can get, give themselves some confidence that they can finish the project that they're building. So there's been quite an emphasis on products coming from outside um, the UK. Um, let's make sure that we're not caught at the wrong time is really what they're mm. been trying to manage. So, mm. at all? They, they, they are to the extent that they're having to bring, not having, they are choosing to bring <laughs> certain materials in um, in much bigger bulk and have them available in volume that they wouldn't otherwise um, do. Um, so yes is the answer. Do you have any percentages as to the number of uh, uh, EU workers in the construction industry? and uh, what sort of percentage of materials that are used in the construction industry that come from the EU? These are not percentages I'm carrying in my head. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the number and the percentages really vary with the, the work and the nature of the work and the volume of work. During the boom time a few years back, whilst the, you know, the, uh, 
uh, Aberdeen bypass was, being, was, it, what it, was at the peak of its construction, for example, then the percentage of European workers, particularly engineers and professionals, uh, working in Scotland was much higher than it currently is because we've ended, the, the bridge is complete, the, the second Queen's Ferry crossing is complete, the Aberdeen bypass is more or less complete, and so many of the Portuguese, Spanish and other engineers who were working here have moved on to other big projects elsewhere. Um, there are still uh, numbers of uh, European workers in various trades in the, in, in, in the construction industries in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, Percentage-wise, I wouldn't like to put a figure on it because I say it fluctuates depending on the trades that are needed on a particular project at any particular time because the, because the European workers, in many cases being away from home, move down between London and Scotland and else, elsewhere in the UK to follow the, uh, the flow of work and the volume, especially the specialist trades. Materials? Materials the same, yes. I mean, we, we, we variously import uh, anything up to about 40% of our, of our materials. Again, it's, a, it's one of these sort of figures that I've, I've plucked, but it really means very little because obviously if it's, if it's a road you're building, you won't be importing very many materials at all other than perhaps the bridge bearings. Um, if, it's a, if it's a hospital, then, then a much higher percentage of the, uh, of the products that come together to make the building will come from Europe, whether it's, uh, whether it's you know, air conditioning units or it's, or it's cladding systems. Um, the, the industry has developed a very diverse supply chain over, over the whole of Europe. The, I think the only good thing I can say in this case is one of the characteristics of our industry is that we're all very, very pessimistic. Um, and uh, that's probably good in this case because most, most uh, construction companies ha have assumed a long time ago that no deal would be done and that we would be in this situation. I mean, we had a meeting way back before Christmas and we sat, we sat around the table with a, with a bunch of uh, construction companies and asked them just how pessimistic were they and they all said very pessimistic. So that's good news because it means that they've then looked at their pipeline of work, they've looked at what they need in terms of supply <coughs> and they've either been trying to make arrangements for alternative sourcing or they've been trying to make arrangements for things to be procured earlier than the 29th of March and, and taking measures to, to try and protect themselves. Obviously, of course, customers have been doing the same, putting things into contracts perhaps that, that will terminate them if, uh, if, a, if a no deal Brexit was to happen. So I, I think the industry is as well prepared probably as it could ever be. Uh, but how prepared is that? Well, it, it, it'll remain to be seen just what, uh, what comes out of the, of, the, of the wood. But yes, as Ken says, we are, we are at various points affected by European labour fluctuations depending on the type of work that's going on and by imports, again, depending on the, the type of uh, project that we're actually building at this particular point in time. Good to finish on a down note. <laughs> no, we won't finish on a down note. Jamie Halko Johnston has questions. There's a challenge. Um, uh, very quickly, because I'm conscious of the time, I, I wanted to have a, a very brief question on, or a couple of questions on the on the school side. Um, but just first, um, y you've talked about some of the initiatives uh, um, that are involved and some of the different. Um, I think what Dean Lockhart would, would call a cluttered landscape uh, in terms of some of the some of the investment. Um, I'm also very conscious some of the visits and people I've spoken to have talked about some of the skills gaps, but also the skills deficits, particularly within certain disciplines. Uh, and they weren't particularly confident that those ne neither those skills gaps nor um, skills deficits would, would be addressed. I was going to ask you whether you're aware of those, and obviously you've suggested you are, also what your role is, and the suggestion, I think some of the words you used was highlighting and identifying and informing. So if your role is simply to identify, highlight and inform, how confident can you be that we're going to, we're going to be able to address those skills gaps, and more importantly, probably those skills deficits, where we're actually going backwards in some cases? I mean, yes, probably, probably maybe use the wrong words in the sense of... Um, um, <coughs> Can, what can we only identify? Uh, I think one of the powers that the industry leadership group has got is its convening power. Um, and by that, I mean the power through the, 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 the uh, individuals that we have on the, on the group and uh, the, the status that they hold within the industry to uh, bring uh, the various fact the parties together to hammer out solutions. And that, that's where I see our main power really is, is, yes, we can identify the issues through our skills working group, but I think the skills working group should, is also able to convene, as Ken said, to bring Skills Development Scotland, to bring CITV, to bring Scottish Government, and to bring other uh, key players round the table to try and say, well, what, what do we need to do 
to fix these problems that, we, that we're identifying. Um, we're at, we're at, we're at, we're at a, an early stage in the, in the pulling together of this, of this skills committee and under the new strategy. Um, and we've got a new chair of, of that skills group, uh, Emma Dixon, who's just joined the ILG. And uh, she is going through the process of identifying the myriad of organisations that play in the skills sector, making contacts with them all, talking to employers, working out what they're saying about the availability of skills. We'll be bringing all that together within the next few months and con using our convening power to bring all the parties to the table to try and, try and hammer out solutions. As I said, Andrew, we can't enforce, but we can convene and we can knock heads together. You're, you're confident those skills gaps and deficits will be addressed, will be identified and addressed? I, I'm, I'm confident they'll be identified and we will do our darndest to make sure they are, they are okay. addressed. I'm not sure how whether that finished on a, a positive note, but I'm just going to very, very quickly another question. One of the things that has been suggested by a number of different organisations was a, a, a kind of dedicated um, construction um, foundation apprenticeship. Uh, at the moment, there is obviously training at schools. Um, and I wondered what your thoughts were on that and whether that might also help play a role in bringing more digital, uh, digital skills within, uh, within the training in an earlier way, way and engaging with younger people in an earlier age rather than kind of re yes. relying uh, on them coming later. I mean, on the digital point, I mean, we, we are all, you know, um, being an old fogey, um, uh, you know, we, uh, we are aware that, uh, that the, the, the use of uh, digital technology is something that attracts the children and, and pupils to the industry. When, when, when they, they come to our uh, uh, inspiring construction events, the thing that, that everybody's attracted to is the, is the, is the virtual reality headsets and the, uh, uh, you know, the digital iPads that, that we can use to sort of show them what a, what a completed building is going to be. I, mean, I think people have talked earlier in these sessions about building information modeling, which sounds a bit dry, but basically it's about creating a digital twin of a building, so you have the, you have the physical one being built in parallel with the the, the ele electronic model that records all the information. And, and nowadays, that information can be put on a, uh, an, a a virtual reality headset. You put it on, and you can actually look around and see what the building is going to be that you that you're that you're trying to construct. Now, these sort of things are are very very powerful tools in in showing pupils and children, you know, what what the construction industry is going to be seen as the norm in, in, in just a few years' time. So that, I, that has a powerful appeal. I mean, I know you're doing inspiring construction. I've heard very positive things about that. But do you think, as I say, a more, uh, a more focused foundation apprenticeship? There is a foundation apprenticeship um, related to the industry, but not on a kind of more general Not on a more general do you, think, do you think that could be something that, um, that could em uh, encourage more people, to, more people to come in and perhaps encourage more young uh, young women to get involved in the sector. I, I think a lot would depend on how it was presented. You know, what was contained in it, what was the course content. You know, what what were we trying to turn out at the end of the day? Um, because um, the, the industry needs skilled people, and the industry needs skills at uh, at the level of you know for, from from a, an artisan trade skill. Because we've got we still have a massive number of existing buildings that need to be maintained, and they need the, the traditional joiner bricky craftsman skills to, to still be created. And, and I think that's the opportunity to, to stay on the positive. The opportunity is that the industry um, hasn't, to my mind, done enough to attract um, young people into industry in the last few years for whatever reason. And certainly we, we need to substantially improve the diversity uh, of the workforce that we, we attract. And in, interestingly, part, part of the part of the the lead up work to inspiring construction was I found myself um, in various um, events where we had invited uh, the secondary schools to come and have a look at our projects, um, and I and I very much found myself in a situation where the school what the schools were sending to the event were very much focused on um, low skill trade background. Um, and when we started to open that conversation up, it became very apparent that, that the industry has allowed um, the perception to grow that, that we're all about just trades and just um, wet building sites. Yeah. Um, whereas actually, we're, there's, there's probably not very many things that the construction industry doesn't do um, in, in the contemplation of um, careers. Uh, so whether it's a professional career as an architect or a Quantity surveyor or an accountant, or whether it's in IT, 
Um, there's a broad range of skills, and what we need to get better at is um, putting the information out there, not only to the pupils, but to the teachers uh, who are communicating um, to say, look, this is a great industry. It's got great opportunities, and actually, it's very, very rewarding. Um, and 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 one of the one of the things that when you've been in construction, um, one of the things that you get take great pride in, and as Ron says, as you get older, you you, you pass more of it because you've built more, uh, or you've developed more. But you know, we, we're creating projects, roads, infrastructure. Um, that will be there for generations to come. And, and, and we take great pride in the fact that we've participated, and our teams take great pride in the fact that we've participated in, in delivering that, that product. So we as an industry need to get the message out, and we need to get it out more positively uh, in order to attract a more diverse um, uh, pipeline of talent um, into the industry. So that's the opportunity. I think that's a positive. Thank note. you very much. That's a positive note to finish on. So thank you to all of our witnesses for coming in today. I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session. Thank you.